people like me. You need people like me so you can point your f***ing fingers and say, that's the bad guy. Okay, and now it's time for our weekend recap. We're going to kick it off with the sequel, the second fight between Sandy Ryan and former champion Erica Farias, who beat Sandy the first time out. This time, as I predicted, as I expected, Sandy Ryan secured the W, though not exactly in the fashion that I predicted, that I expected. This was on the undercard of Dalton Smith versus Sam O'Mason. Dalton Smith looked the part, racking up a highlight reel knockout, as did Sandy Ryan looking the part, boxing and moving. You know, it never even dawned on me ahead of this rematch that Sandy Ryan might take a more cerebral approach to dealing with Erica Farias. Yes, I've grown so accustomed to seeing Sandy Ryan win her fights through offense and strength of arms, it didn't dawn on me that she might decide to box, use her height, use her reach, those long levers, and fight behind her jab to manage the distance. What she did, and she neutralized Erica Farias, the older, smaller, slower fighter who couldn't get within striking distance. It was a very different aesthetic to what we saw in the first fight, to where both fighters were trading shots within striking distance in the pocket. In this fight, Sandy Ryan was on the balls of her feet. And that made all the difference. It's not the strategy I expected, but it was a winning strategy. Now that Sandy Ryan packs a big enough punch that she can hurt Erica Farias, we saw that in the first fight, and I was more or less anticipating a more aggressive, offensive Sandy Ryan in the rematch, throwing combinations, throwing punches in bunches, but she opted to box. She opted to stick and move and stay on the outside, manage the distance. Keep that jab in Erica Farias' face, keep pumping out that jab, because so long as you're doing that, Erica Farias can't get within striking distance to do anything. You know, perhaps what it was is that Sandy was a little bit too immobile the first time out, making it easier for Erica Farias to crowd her, because she wasn't moving. In the first fight, she wasn't. She was choosing to engage, choosing to stand her ground against Erica Farias, which made it easier for Erica to get into the fight. In this fight, she didn't play Erica's game. She made the old girl work for her. Used those 38-year-old legs to try and catch up to Sandy Ryan, who was boxing comfortably behind a judicious lead hand. Sandy occasionally showed the right, and you could see there was a lot of mustard on it, though she wasn't going for power. And you could see this time out, it wasn't her intention to overpower Erica Farias so much as out maneuver her and out muscle her and i struggled to give erica farias more than one or two rounds in this thing two of the three judges had the fight a lot closer than i did i had sandy winning this thing wide credit to both combatants both women erica farias showed that even at 38 years old she's still a handful and you need to compete at a certain level in order to share the ring with her and sandy ryan showed that she's more than just a statuesque 140 pound fighter she's more than just a puncher she's more than one way to skin a cat and she showed that and the situation calls for it, Sandy Ryan showed she can be the boxer just as much as she can be the puncher. Congratulations to her for advancing to a professional record of four wins and one loss. She has effectively exacted revenge on the former champion. We then come to the main event of that same card, the punch-perfect performance of unbeaten up-and-comer, super lightweight Dalton Smith, who advanced to a professional record of 12 wins, no losses, and no draws with 10 knockouts, 10 knockouts now, having painted the town red on Sam O'Mason's face. Dalton Smith, 25 years old, unbeaten up-and-comer, very generous physical dimensions for 140 pounds. The speed and accuracy of Dalton Smith's backhand jumped out at the screen. One of his standout qualities in this performance against Sam O'Mason, who he dropped two times. Though what's noteworthy is that even though Dalton was the so obviously faster guy, sharper guy with the heavier hands, he didn't waste any punches. He was surgical, patient, poised, accurate, gradually just chipping away at Sam O'Mason Mason in a short amount of time and piling up a lot of damage very quickly by the fifth round. Sam O'Mason was a bloody mess. Every time Dalton decided to let go of that right hand, you could see there was a lot on it. And what's noteworthy is, even though he knew he could hurt the guy, he didn't waste his punches, he didn't waste his shots. Very mature for a guy who ahead of this fight was only 11-0, 12-0 now. 10 knockouts. Sam O'Mason, God bless him, 
He was never in this fight. Dalton Smith was just too good, too good all around. The straight right hand, the backhand of Dalton Smith left a lasting impression. In a division full of southpaws like Sandor Martin, Regis Prograrius, Jose Zapata, Harry Antoine Russell, Jack Catterall, and Tosh Jaylor, having a good backhand, a good straight right hand, that comes in handy. It might. The 140-pound division just got a little deeper as Dalton Smith advances to a professional record of 12-0. 12-0 with 10 KOs. Congratulations to him. In a division full of southpaws, it helps to have the southpaw killer. The southpaw killer, as we all know, is the straight right hand. Dalton Smith's got it. Let's see if he can stay in character as he progresses. Then move on to the Golden Boy Promotions card where Marlon Esparza. Marlon Esparza, unified flyweight champion, was in action in defense of her two alphabet titles, the WBC and WBA against mandatory challenger Eva Guzman, who, while she wasn't completely out of her depth... Oh, she wasn't out of her depth. She didn't look out of place. But she did seem always just a step behind Marlon. Marlena Sparza, who threw the shorter, more compact shots mid-range to inside. The tidiness of Marlena Sparza's punches and how they were difficult for someone like Eva Guzman to counter. It was Marlon doing all the countering, angling off that torso and bringing over shots. Or catching Eva Guzman's shots on the arms and gloves and countering in kind, bringing shots over. I want to say that Marlena Sparza managed the distance well. That while Marlena Sparza doesn't have any standout qualities like concussive punching power, or blistering hands, hand speed. She's a very good boxer and last night against Eva Guzman she was just better. Better all around, cutting angles and angling off as she let go of that jab, stepping into it keeping that head off center as to not be in line for any shots, any return fire from Eva Guzman. She managed the distance well. She was better in the pocket than Eva. It's the little things. It's not the broad strokes, it's the little things. The slight movements, being side on. Staying that way, not being callous and cavalier just because you're somewhat faster than the other fighter. Coming in at a slight crouch keeping that chin tucked, side on, as to roll and ride any oncoming shots, any oncoming punches, and still being able to counter in kind. It's the little things. Marlon's a good boxer. I don't say that often enough, but she's actually very good technically. Technically, she is. She may not be the fastest fighter, but she's fast enough that she's formidable, and she may not be the most athletic fighter, but she's athletic enough that she can manage the distance, manage the distance well. And she may not be big on power. She may not be the most heavy-handed puncher, but she does make up for for it in counter shots countering opportunities and those shots you don't see. Marlene is a good counter puncher. She may not have cinder blocks for hands, but getting off a couple of shots that the other girl doesn't see, that can make the other girl hesitant, that can get some respect. Regularly landing punches that the other fighter isn't ready for. The other fighter, they don't see the shots. They don't brace themselves for them. I have to admit that Marlon Esparza, she is improving. She is coming into her own. She won a decision, the way I said she would. And post-fight, she actually called out. Gabriela Alaniz, this division's newly crowned WBO champion, a heavy-handed Argentinian puncher. A high-risk fight, if you ask me, and I talked about it ahead of this fight. I was expecting Marlene Esparza to call out Leonela Yudica, this division's IBF champion. An Argentine, the same way that Gabriela is an Argentine, but nowhere is near as big a puncher. And as luck would have it, Marlene Esparza wants to grab the bull by the horns and take on Gabriela straight away. I'm not against that. It's not what I expected, but if that's what Marlene Len wants to do, I'm here for it. I've talked about the risks associated with that fight and how this is going to be different than taking on a long-reigning, albeit aging champion in an Oko Fujioka. Gabriella Alaniz isn't just a hard puncher and a newly crowned champion. She's a hard punching newly crowned champion in her prime. She's spiteful. Everything she throws is with bad intentions. She may not be the technician that Marlene is. She may not have to be to give Marlene Esparza a lot of problems. A little something to look forward to later on this year. There's still plenty of time left in the year of of 2022 to schedule a unification match for this division's unified champion Marlon Esparza. Here's looking forward to Esparza versus Alanis and congratulations to Marlon for successfully defending her two alphabet titles. We then come to the welterweight contest between Blair Cobbs, who is on the rebound off that vicious knockout loss to Alexis Rocha, and former WBO super lightweight champion Mighty Mo Hooker, who, as you all may know, 
blew the weight ahead of this thing. This was supposed to be a welterweight contest. It was supposed to be, I should say. It ended up being fought at a contracted weight of 150 pounds. Not an encouraging omen for Mighty Mo Hooker's focus ahead of this thing. To say that he got off to a rough start is an understatement. He got dropped early by Blair Cobbs, who, as stated, was on the rebound and seemed the more switched on guy, just sharper, faster. Blair's punches had snap on him. Maurice is dead. Blair couldn't miss Mighty Mo Hooker with the straight left hand, the backhand. Blair Cobbs being a southpaw, he leads with his right to set up his left, and he couldn't miss Maurice Hooker with that straight left hand. He was snapping his head back early on. Dropped him early on. Blair Cobbs dropped him three times overall. Serious deficit in points for the former WBO super lightweight champion, experiencing weight issues, among other things. He was just not in this fight. Couldn't turn the tide. It was really the worst I've ever seen him. The absolute worst I've ever seen from Maurice Hooker. Hooker, who was never a defensive wizard. Defense was never his calling card, but offensively, he can be formidable. We saw that in the Ramirez fight. We saw that in the Virgil Ortiz fight. And he was catching Blair Cobbs at the most opportune time to catch Blair Cobbs when he's coming off a vicious knockout loss to another fighter, another welterweight in Alexis Rocha. And Mighty Mo, he just wasn't able to capitalize. Always a step behind Blair Cobbs, who was countering in kind, moving and punching and setting up that straight left hand, backhand. And as stated, Blair Cobbs, he couldn't miss with that thing. He kept finding a home for it. Maurice Hooker's punch resistance. He wasn't taking those shots well. You could see that. His legs looked slow. Shots didn't seem to have anything on them. In the pocket, mid-range to inside, Blair Cobbs being somewhat faster than Mighty Mo Hooker, he was getting the better end of those exchanges, beating Mighty Mo Hooker to the punch. I mean, it was just a hard night for the former WBO super lightweight champion. And with that, Blair Cobbs gets himself back into the winner's bracket in good fashion, I might add. There are fights out there for Blair, believe it or not. As political as today's welterweight division is, there are some other fights and other avenues of opportunity that Blair can explore. Maybe he shoots for a rematch with Alexis Rocha, sees if he can't avenge the loss, or maybe they put Blair in there with Virgil Ortiz, who was the headliner for this show. Alongside Michael McKenson, who put forth a valiant effort, maybe they put Blair in there with Michael McKenson. Maybe, depending on what happens between young Connor Ben and Chris Eubank Jr., or what doesn't happen, maybe they can set Blair up for a trip to the UK against Connor. That promises to be an all-action shootout, an all-action fight, as they are both action fighters, quite offensively minded. He can make some money fighting Connor Ben in the UK if he's willing to travel. The world title picture is all locked up and frozen for everybody. Blair Cobbs included. Fighting for an alphabet title isn't an option for anyone right now, regardless of what side of the street they're on. Whether you're Blair Cobbs, Virgil Ortiz, Michael McKenson, Connor Ben, a Montestanionis, Jaron Boots Ennis, or even a former champion in Keith Thurman. Until we know what's going to happen between Terrence and Errol, the world title picture is locked up and frozen. But that doesn't mean that there aren't other options out there. Options for Blair Cobb. He's an interesting character in today's welterweight division, to say the least. Not exactly the poster child for technique, but he's serviceable. He is entertaining. Win or lose, Blair Cobb. Yeah, he's a fun guy to watch, whether he's getting the shit beat out of him or he's beating the shit out of somebody. He's an entertaining fighter. Got personality, and he just racked up another W. Got himself back in the winner's bracket. I wouldn't mind seeing Blair Cobbs get back out there at least one more time this year because there is still time. Congratulations to him for outpointing Mighty Mo Hooker. We then come to the main event of that same card, a battle of the unbeatens in the welterweight division between unbeaten Virgil Ortiz and then unbeaten Michael McKinson, who put up a better fight than I thought he would. At least he lasted longer than I thought he would. I thought he'd get stopped in six. He got stopped in nine, lasted three rounds longer than I thought he would. He showed durability, showed heart, and he's got nothing to be ashamed of losing to a guy, a killer, like a Virgil Ortiz. For what it's worth, it was a solid choice for Virgil's big return fight. Virgil, ahead of this fight, he hadn't seen action in approximately a year. He hadn't seen action since August of last year, returning to action in August of this year. And he wasn't facing a sitting duck, a stationary target. Not only was he facing an unbeaten up-and-comer who didn't know how to lose, Virgil had to teach him. Not only was Virgil facing an ambitious, unbeaten up-and-comer, a southpaw, a boxer more than a puncher, and a mover, a guy 
who's not just going to sit there and let you tee off on him. He's not an immobile target. He's a moving target. It was a solid choice because he's facing an unbeaten guy who can move, use the ring, and Virgil had ring rust to shake off. So all things considered, a solid choice in what was a solid fight of unbeaten up-and-comers. Virgil got off to a bit of a rough start. You could see he was struggling to land clean punches upstairs. His head punches, they weren't quite finding a home as McKinson, a defensively responsible fighter, side on, rolling and riding shots. And don't forget that he's a southpaw, so he's moving to his right outside of Virgil's left. At least in the early goings of this fight, in the beginning, it was hard for Virgil to land clean on this guy, to connect with headshots, head punches, but it's the body punches that finally slowed. You notice that Virgil Ortiz occasionally would get a body shot in there, a hard body shot. But while he wasn't able to pin down Michael McKinson, who was fighting on the fly, fighting on the move, he wasn't able to pin him down and unload to his midsection. Every so often, he'd mix in body punches. And one or two would get through. The tried and true method to slow down a moving target, the tried and true method to take a guy's legs away is to go to his body, go to his midsection. In that way, Virgil Ortiz showed a bit of ring IQ. IQ. Ring savvy. Going to McKinson's midsection when his head proved hard to hit. And that made all the difference because that's what slowed Michael down. If Virgil would have spent most of this fight headhunting, we might have been having a different conversation right now. It wasn't the head punches that got to Michael McKinson. It was the pace of the fight that Virgil wasn't going to stop coming after him. And every time he did come after him, he'd make sure to go to his body at least once or twice. Take something out of that guy. Virgil is a big enough guy and a strong enough guy, a prolific enough puncher. He's not always going to land. But whatever he does land, there's a lot on it. In tandem with the overall pace of the fight, that all that moving around is still taking something out of you. Even when you're getting out of the way of shots and Virgil's not quite landing cleanly, having to move around that much is still wearing on Michael McKinson's energy reserves. Or on them, I should say. How many times did he get dropped? Two? Three? In the ninth, it was Michael McKinson's own corner that threw the towel. They knew if they keep this guy in there, it's just going to get worse. He's only going to take more punishment. Punishment. A wise decision from Team McKinson to pull their man out because he wasn't fighting anymore. At that point, he was just surviving. Going from end to end in the ring, trying his best not to get hit, though you could see what was happening. You could see where this fight was going. Ahead of this fight, I saw unbeaten up-and-comer Connor Ben say that Michael McKinson is one of the most unmarketable fighters that are out there, though in truth, Michael McKinson is a quality operator, and it takes a quality operator to beat him. I don't know that Connor Ben would have been able to do to Michael. Michael, what Virgil just did to Michael, and that's just being honest. If things don't work out between Connor and Chris, I wouldn't mind seeing Connor Ben versus Michael McKinson in the UK. As far as Virgil and what's next for him, post fight, he was asked about Terence Crawford, and he gave a no nonsense, realistic answer. We all know that Terence is busy right now. He's in negotiations for a Spence fight. None of those alphabet titles are available to anyone, Virgil Ortiz included, so I don't know. Maybe they get Virgil in there with Alexis Rocha, maybe they get him in there with Blair Cobbs, who fought on this same card. Maybe they revisit that Avenesian fight. You know, this fight was a WBA eliminator. It appears that Virgil was going the WBA route. If he's on that route, this fight lines him up for a Montestanionis. Unbeaten a Montestanionis, who just beat Radzov Butaev. You know, Stanionis is not an according to Hoyle PBC fighter. He's a pro bellum fighter. He's with Richard Schaefer. And if Schaefer and Showtime can't get this guy a date, why don't they just put him in there with Virgil Ortiz? You don't get the sense he's on the cusp of fighting Errol Spence Jr. for the full title. So what are they going to do, shelf him for the rest of the year? Put him in there with Virgil. You might as well.